Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today, in the same vein as discussing the pedagogy of the oppressed, I would like to sort of share my specific impressions of the book and its significance from the point of view of revolutionary praxis. Now, a lot of people think of Paulo Freire and pedagogy of the oppress and immediately just associate it with a book that is about education. I actually recommended this book to one of the master's students to use as a theoretical grounding in writing her thesis and her professors turned it down because to them Freire was an educational theorist or a theorist of education. But in my reading over the years, for these last three years as I have been recording the series on pedagogy of the oppressed, I have come to appreciate the real potential of this book as a book that really teaches the philosophical but also practical aspects of developing a revolutionary praxis. So first of all, what is praxis in Freire? If you've been following the series, you already know that praxis is a combination of reflection, thinking about the world, thinking about the things, and then performing certain actions to change the world. Action and reflection, when it comes together, it forms a praxis. So why do I consider the book as sort of a textbook on revolutionary praxis? Is because it, first of all, sets up a huge goal to create a world in which people, can realize their full humanity. That's the mission. Now, that would be a laudable mission for any revolutionary praxis. In order to do that, what Freire is proposing is that we need to change how we think the world, how we imagine the world, and that is done through education through what later is termed critical pedagogy. So in the process, people who have been silenced, who have been oppressed, learn to unlearn the system within which their consciousness is formed, within which their worldview is formed, and relearn a praxis in which they can express their own humanity freely as they have thought through it and not as it was imposed by others, right? So that is revolutionary in itself, that kind of an education. But then he also theorizes and discusses throughout the book the possibilities of making sure that the revolution is not appropriated by an elite. That's why there are admonitions in the book and declarations in the book that the leaders cannot say, help us bring the revolution and then we will change the world. No, changing the world has to be part of the revolutionary process. We cannot gain power through unreflected means through the same means as those of our oppressors and then hope to change the world. So what that then teaches us was this fear, this conundrum, this question that even Deleuze and Guattari can't really answer in their work. I mean, when someone asks them about, you know, what to do about counter-revolution, how to stop the revolutionaries from becoming oppressors themselves, their answer is we, we have to work with that impossibility, right? But Freire's answer is that for any revolutionary change, the change must happen after the work of education 
has been done. After the leaders have learned that they can't impose their will from the top and people have become aware of their own world and their place in it and they have dislodged what was overwritten on their selves through an oppressive system. And I think that's an insight, amazingly brilliant insight for any kind of revolutionary change and revolutionary praxis. Then there is another insight that I've talked about over several lectures where he talks about what to do if people from the oppressor group want to join the revolutionary movement. Now remember, in um, Marx, I think especially in the Communist Manifesto, Marx basically believes that the petite bourgeois, the little capitalists, would eventually join the proletariat. But here, the way Freire is articulating it I think is more understandable. What he's saying is that during the revolutionary movement, if some part of the oppressor group, if some people break away from their dominant group and want to join the movement, the movement should create space for them to join. But these people, when they join the movement, they cannot bring their old assumptions and try to impose them on the people. They have to learn with the people the new modes of thinking and the new practices of being human. It's not re-education. They have to be committed to that change. And I think that's an insight of immense significance. Then towards the end of the book, or rather in chapter 3, he also teaches us how to develop revolutionary curriculum, right? It doesn't have to be s created by a central authority and sent down to districts, no. For each community, the experts have to go in with due humility, meet the local people, meet the local thinkers and local workers hear their stories, and then with their insights create the curriculum of revolutionary education and revolutionary change. So there is no top-down mandate in this revolutionary praxis. So overall, yes, the book is about education and critical pedagogy, but it's a pedagogy that is trying to teach us, and the book is trying to teach us as to how to mobilize an everyday act of educating the people in a way that education isn't just about facts and mathematics, but that it becomes a process which makes the teachers and the students active participants in thinking the world differently, in finding what's their place in it. And once they have done that, once they have objectively analyzed why do they think the way they do, why is the world so unjust and lopsided, then they don't turn around in anger to change it, but they change it with love, humility, dialogue, compassion and cooperation with each other. So think of it in this way, and I'm probably gonna leave this here. The most important concept that Freire theorizes in this book is consensia cow, right? What literally is consensia cow? I mean, I have a video on it. It's basically thinking critically about the world, trying to understand it, that's one part of it, and then actively seeking to change the world for the better. These two combined then develop a revolutionary praxis. So overall, 
I know it's not a very comprehensive explanation, but I thought I should have a standalone video that emphasizes that this book isn't just about pedagogy. It's about revolutionary change and revolutionary praxis, and that when we read it, we have to keep that in mind constantly to remind ourselves to read it from that perspective. So overall, I am confident in saying based on my own reading of revolutionary materials, materials about social change and justice, that in this last reading that I've done with you over the last three years, and I'm still trying to conclude it, it has become clear to me that Pedagogy of the Oppressed is not just a book about pedagogy or critical pedagogy, but rather one of the most comprehensive engagements with education, revolutionary change, and developing a revolutionary practice. That's all. Please do share if you have any ideas. I would love to read your comments about this. As always, I'm grateful for your support, and uh, I will try to finish the series soon and hope to engage with discussions about the book and hope they continue. Please stay safe, take care of each other, be generous and kind, and from me to you, like always, peace and love.